Hi, so yeah, I'm at the University of Edinburgh. I'm working with Jacques and uh, Hussein Kapivad, who's now at Durham. Um, I'm going to be talking about inertial gravity wave diffusion by geostrophic turbulence and the impact of flow time dependence. And if I get time, the impact of um, some other flow induced perturbations. Uh, so I'm going to start by introducing to you the uh, inertial gravity wave diffusion by time independent geostrophic flow. And then largely what I've been working on is adding time dependence to this setup. Uh, so that's going to be the bulk of the talk. And then if I get time, I'll talk to you about um, shallow water wave diffusion uh, and the effect of height fluctuations on this diffusion. Uh, so in you probably all know this already, but we've got a rotating stratified fluid um, and it can be decomposed into uh, inertial gravity waves and geostrophic flow. Uh, so our uh, inertial gravity waves are um, uh, in the regime we're considering much shorter uh, wavelength than the flow and much quicker than the flow. Uh, and they have a dispersion relation given by omega there. Um, so F here is your Coriolis frequency, N is your buoyancy frequency, and theta is just the angle we make with the vertical. Um, and so that the bit under the square root is your intrinsic frequency, and then the U dot K part is your Doppler shift term. Uh, and that's induced by the flow U. Uh, and then the flow has approximately zero frequency. So hopefully this will work. So uh, this is a 3D boost and S simulation. Um, so on the left, we've got the flow. So that's, uh, I think it's plotting the vorticity. Um, and then on the right, we have, uh, so it's a, it's a fully evolved uh, geostrophic flow and we inject a, a fully evolved boost and S Flow, sorry, and we inject a plane wave into this simulation and we scatter it basically. So when these two components interact, um, uh, it's working. Okay, uh, it'll be fine. To be fair, we don't need to see these. So there is a nice um, simulation. What would happen is the flow on the left persists, so it doesn't really change much. The length scales stay the same. It has no preferred direction. That's the start at the end. Uh, the start and the end. It's the same. And then on the right, what would happen uh, is the plane wave um, has a preferred direction and a characteristic wavelength, and it loses both of these as the uh, simulation progresses. Uh, so it's scattered in a catalytic interaction with the geostrophic flow. Uh, and in fact, in a couple of slides, you'll see snapshots from that. Uh, so you don't need to uh, you don't need to see the video. Um, so this scattering process uh, in the regime of very slow flow compared to the waves is described by uh, a diffusion equation. Uh, and this is a diffusion equation for action in wave vector space. Uh, so it's wave action in wave vector space. So A is your action, uh, C is just the group velocity of the waves, and um, F is some forcing. Uh, and then D is your diffusivity. So the diffusivity captures the effect of the flow on the waves. Um, and uh, in, uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a flow dependent tensor basically. Uh, and we can use this to then find the energy density of the waves. Uh, so this was first introduced by McComas and Bretherton. Um, and then uh, Jacques and Sain and uh, Miles Sather re-derived this um, for uh, using matched asymptotics. And they make the assumption that the geostrophic flow is time independent because it's so much slower than the uh, inertial gravity waves. Um, and if you make this assumption, then you get the result that the diffusivity is uh, orthogonal to your uh, vertical angle. Um, and what this means is you've got no diffusion of uh, energy in that direction. Um, and because our dispersion relation is only dependent on this angle, uh, your constant frequency surface is a cone. So basically what they predict uh, is that you only have energy diffusing along a cone of constant frequency in wave vector space. So uh, Dong et al uh, have gone away and they uh, looked at uh, the diffusion equation in uh, the shallow water case. So it's the same, but it's in two dimensions now. Uh, and they find that if you relax the assumption of uh, time independence um, and you make your flow slowly time dependent, you get uh, diffusion across a cone of, con uh, a co uh, so in two dimensions, the constant frequency surface is just a circle uh, and you get significant diffusion across this circle. Um, 
So this was the simulation you were meant to see. So at the top, you've got snapshots from the simulation. So you can see that the plane wave breaks down as it's scattered by the flow. And uh, in case space, the energy uh, starts as a single point. So that's the single wavelength of the wave to start off with. And as it's scattered, the energy uh, spreads along the cone. So again, this is another 3D boost nest simulation. Uh, oh no, it's the same one. Okay. Um, so yeah, it spreads along. And you can see that it's spreading along the cone. It's not really spreading much across it. So it seems that that time independence is well justified. Um, this is another snapshot of a simulation. So this is a, a forced boost and S simulation. Um, and it's uh, run for a very long time. And then this is a snapshot at the end of the time. Um, and you can see that, so the uh, y-axis is your vertical wave number and the x-axis is your horizontal wave number. So it's like vertical slices of your cone. And uh, the darker areas indicate higher energy and the lighter lower energy. So you can see that there is an energy spread across this cone. So um, basically what I've been doing is I've been asking the question, can flow time dependence radically alter the diffusion of inertial gravity waves by geostrophic turbulence? So do we get, when we introduce flow time dependence, a significant diffusion across this cone of constant frequency? And to do this, what I've done is I've solved the um, steady state force diffusion equation. So we've just removed the time, uh, uh, it's just, uh, yeah, just steady state um, uh, with time dependent flow. So to do this, we use much less antarctics. We find a correction to the diffusivity, the time, in, uh, the flow dependent time independent diffusivity. Um, and there's a correction to that given by uh, time dependence. And uh, the small parameter we're using is the ratio of the flow frequency to the wave frequencies. Um, and we solve the resulting PDE um, for energy, uh, energy density. And we use a forcing, we use a forcing in a ring. Uh, so um, a constant uh, radial wave number and a constant theta. Um, and that can be generalized to more general forcings by uh, integrating. Um, and so we have this uh, slowly time dependent PDE, uh, slowly time dependent flow PDE. And we look for solutions at, uh, in this new angle vari variable sigma. Uh, so theta star is your forcing, um, oh yeah, I should say, sorry, uh, theta star and K star are your forcing um, angle and uh, radial wave number. And we uh, put ourselves onto the forcing uh, cone, and then we look a small distance away from it using uh, this new angle variable sigma and a, um, a boundary layer which is epsilon thick, so it's a it's a thin boundary layer, um, the width of this uh, ratio there, um, and that basically means that if we have a solution that decays in the boundary layer, we've got something that is very localized to the cone, and if it doesn't decay, then uh, you know time dependence might be an issue. Uh, so it turns out we do have an exact solution for this. Um, so I think most of those variables you know what they are. The Q here is the uh, associated or maybe just the Legendre function of the second kind. Uh, that might not mean a lot, but I've plotted it so you'll be able to understand what it looks like. Um, so on your uh, vertical axis here, it's just the energy scaled by the forcing wave number. And on the horizontal axis, it's just your rescaled angle uh, scaled by the uh, forcing wave number as well. The reason we've done that is so that it's not um, dependent on your forcing wave number. Um, and you can see that, uh, so this is uh, on the cone basically, and if you're moving away in sigma, you're moving away from the cone. So um, the energy distribution is incredibly localized to the cone. We've got decay away from the cone here. Um, and as you move along the cone in K, you also get uh, decreased energy, which is what you'd expect. Uh, so from this, we can conclude that energy is localized within an order epsilon layer around the constant frequency cone. Um, and that flow time dependence doesn't radically alter this uh, diffusion regime. Uh, so this is uh, the 3D boost nest uh, simulation, the first one I showed you with the uh, snapshot and the cone seeping across. Um, and then this is the equivalent to uh, this um, plot here. So the jagged lines are your simulation and the dotted lines are the uh, exact solution fitted to that simulation. So we have two parameters here, one which corresponds to the scale of the forcing and one which sort of uh, determines how thick your boundary layer is. And um, we fitted the same parameters on each of these. So, so the top one you fit to, and then the rest of them have the same parameters. 
And you can see that this exact solution has roughly captured the both the decay of the energy and um, how the energy goes down as you move along the cone. So it's in pretty good agreement. Um, so first bit conclusion, um, the interaction of uh, waves and flow, uh, inertial gravity waves and geostrophic flows models a diffusion process, um, and the time independent uh, flow in this diffusion process suggests that you get um, just diffusion along the cone and not across the cone of constant frequency. And by relaxing this uh, assumption, we found that the energy spectrum is still very localized to this cone, and it's in quite good agreement with the boost gas simulation. And this has just been accepted for JFM, so hopefully it'll be online in a couple of weeks. Uh, but the archive's there if you want to have a look. Um, I think I've got time. Uh, so what I've been doing since then is uh, we've been looking at, so the diffusivity here comes from the Doppler shift term in the dispersion relation, um, but you could have a general diffusivity that incorporates other flow-induced uh, effects. Uh, so this might include, uh, so the ones we've been looking at are, uh, you get uh, high fluctuations induced from the geostrophic flow uh, in the shallow water case, and you get uh, stratification variations in the boost and case. So in shallow water systems, your dispersion relation is given by this. So um, uh, I think that's all things you, so the, the H is the uh, the depth of the layer, and then you've had the Doppler shift term again. Um, and what we can do is we can add a perturbation to H, this delta H, and that satisfies the geostrophic balance on your right there. Um, and if you add in this perturbation, you then get a different diffusivity, which is not just dependent on the Doppler shift. So your diffusion equation remains the same, but your diffusivity now has this uh, delta H component. So interestingly, we don't get any cross terms between the uh, Doppler shift and the height fluctuation terms. We just get a height fluctuation term and a Doppler shift term. And the Doppler shift terms, just what we've been doing before. Um, so to sort of judge how much of an effect the um, height fluctuation can have on this diffusion process, uh, what we've done is we just plotted a ratio between the two terms, uh, just the two uh, Ds there, and um, only one component of the tensor is really significant. So it's just the ratio of those two components. Um, and K, big K star here is your characteristic uh, flow wave number. Um, and then LD is your Rosby deformation radius. And so we plotted this ratio uh, below there, um, and you can see that um, uh, we're sort of more over to that side of things. Um, it uh, tends to a constant value. Uh, so for example, for um, LDK star, oh yeah, so it's for a few values of LDK star, and for LDK star equals one, which is um, roughly quasi-geostrophic, uh, this tends to um, about a quarter. So the ratio of your high fluctuation to your Doppler shift terms is about a quarter, um, which means the Doppler shift term is more dominant, but it's not orders of magnitude dominant. It's still, the high fluctuation term is, is probably uh, not negligible, or at least it needs to be taken into account. And then if you look at lower values of LD, uh, K star, um, this grows, and if you look at higher, it decays. So the key take home message from this section is that um, in shallow waterway diffusion, um, height fluctuations induced by geostrophic flow are not necessarily negligible. So we need to rethink this diffusion process and add in this uh, high fluctuation diffusivity term. Uh, so what I'd like to do next is I'd like to support this with some numerics, um, some ray tracing potentially to find, uh, so there's, you can find for small theta, I think, an uh, analytic solution to the diffusion equation. I'd like to verify this with the ray tracing for the new high perturbation thing. And then I'm gonna, I started doing this, but I didn't get very far with it. So we're looking at the boost and S equivalent to this. So in the boost and S uh, system, the 3D boost and S system, um, instead of high fluctuations induced by the geostrophic flow, we'll have um, stratification changes. And that will then give you another term in your diffusivity. Uh, so I think that's me done. Uh, and uh, yeah, any questions?